of our guests are all in the, uh, the packet. I'm not going to uh, read them in detail, so I'm going to do kind of a, a brief introduction. But this is a state and local policymaker panel, and they're, these individuals have been leaders in supporting this approach to education. We have the Ohio State Superintendent of Public Instruction, so uh, Paulo DiMaria. And uh, Paulo is uh, he's the boss. He's the superintendent. <laughs> so, uh, but as we said, cooperative process. He's got a long history. And again, the bio is very impressive. Uh, Robert Hurd, who's the vice chair of the Board of Education for the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. So he's, he's one of the key leaders here locally. And then um, somebody after my own heart, a a former state, uh, she's, I'm a former state senator, she is a <laughs> senator, Senator Peggy Lerner, and Peggy is the chair of the Ohio State Senate Standing Committee on Education. And uh, Senator Lerner is, she's really, um, she's tops. So we, we've got the best here for the commission. And what I'm gonna do, you just get started, ask one question about all three of the panels. I've got a couple where maybe everybody can address them and then I've got some specific ones that maybe, that, but I'm gonna be pretty flexible if you, somebody wants to comment, uh, expand, we'll do that. We wanna try by, oh, say 9.35, uh, 9.40 to open it up. So I, I can see, so we got 15, 20 minutes, 25 at the max here. If it's so compelling, that'd be, we'll keep the questions at a bay out there. But anyway, um, so to all of the, from your perspective as leaders in, in public education, uh, let's just start with the obvious question. Uh, why is it important to integrate social, emotional, and academic development? Superintendent, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, so um, I think uh, the thing we see is ultimately, when you look at it from a state policy perspective, we want to create the conditions that allow students to be successful, right? And I think um, as we've seen education you know, evolve, uh, we increasingly are aware that in order for students to succeed, we have to address, you know, all their needs, including their social emotional needs. If they're not um, in a place where they're ready to learn, not in a place where they're ready to engage, uh, you know, that's a problem. That creates a barrier. And, and again, I think you've seen tremendous examples here in Cleveland about how that can happen at the local level. I think we at the state understand that to the extent that we can create a policy framework without necessarily being like overly prescriptive or overly you know, mandatory, uh, but provide some guidance and some structures, uh, that plays a role. And, and we've done some of that in Ohio, and, uh, and, and we continue to do that. So, so I think it's that combination of setting a policy framework and then also you know, being able to support practice. But we can get into those practice issues a little bit later. We'll go right down line, Senator. One of the things that I've observed um, since I really started digging into education policy about eight years ago was we've tried about everything in this country and, and you know, we have this massive federal program involving a lot of testing and monitoring, <clears throat> all to try to get to those children who don't seem to be achieving in this nation. It's the same 30, 40 percent of kids all the time that are failing and, and we haven't found the answer. And one of the things that we say all the time and you hear all the time is, well, if you knew what kind of lives these children came from or what sort of homes they came from, you would understand how I as a teacher can't teach them. Well, that's not good enough. And what we haven't tried to do is to really address those deficits the kids come to school with. I mean, the trauma in their lives creates trauma in their classroom. And until we acknowledge that and confront it head on with very purposeful public policy, we're not going to see that 30 or 40 percent succeed. And so I think it's, you know, it, it may be the latest thing in education, but I think it may be the most important thing we've ever tried. Well, Mr. Erd, you've been active for a while? Yes, 12 years. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, in the past, we've come up with these best things since sliced bread solutions and the shortfall I saw over the years um, was that we never really dug down deep to find out why. Uh, some of that is happening here in Cleveland. Uh, was, we were talking earlier about our uh, absenteeism yeah. campaign, which we treat as a political campaign. Yard signs, robocalls, Cleveland Browns calling, mm -hmm. chairman of the uh, school board calling your home. 
to find out why you're not there. But it's, but it's not a, a, a call to the home to, <clears throat> to chastise. It's a call to the home that says, Johnny has missed five days of school. What can we do to help? And oftentimes through that, we find out that there are issues that we can help them address, clothing, housing, uh, mental health issues, things like that. So that's been the important piece for us here locally is to infuse those supports uh, to the student and to the family. What, maybe uh, just to ask you to expand on the school board role, how has the school board um, you know, supported the, this integration of social, emotional, academic uh, development in these 102 <coughs> schools that comprise your uh, impressive system? Um, and some of that might require, I don't know how familiar everyone is with our governance structure here in, in Cleveland. Um, well, we know that it's an appointed board uh, and uh, right. you've got some continuity, you know, you mentioned your case 12 years and yep. other leaders who've had such a commitment that it's lasted over mm -hmm. a period of time. I think that's helpful in a large urban system to have that. It, it, and it is. Um, and beyond that, our structure is much like a large corporation. We don't have a superintendent. We have a CEO. Um, in most school districts, the treasurer reports to the board. We don't have a treasurer. We have a chief financial officer who reports to the CEO. So our job is really to set policy, set direction, uh, a lot of which is done at the recommendation of the CEO. Uh, some of it is done at the urging of the board for things we want to see what our mission and vision might be. And we let the staff put that together. Uh, if you look at the resumes of the school board, and this is probably any school board across the country, there are very few educators on the school board. Mm -hmm. So we don't pretend to be educators, but I think we've spent enough time in the education field to know what should be done, and we allow the experts to get it done and make recommendations to us. So that, that's really kind of how we look at it, at a, you know, a 35,000 Sure. Foot, uh, view, uh, and, and it's tempting as a school board member to want to get involved in the operation of the district. Uh, and, and you get those calls, you know, at your home that uh, I've heard people that. want you yeah. to get involved in the operation of the district. Uh, so, so it's tempting to do that, but um, you, you got to know where your lane is. Really well, Senator, let's go kind of the same question as the chair of the education, the powerful education committee here. Uh, the person that Governor Kasich has to go to to get anything done, uh, and, and probably the superintendent has to come in and right. get down on <laughs> bended knee. So uh, what's the uh, education uh, committee role and the, maybe the legislative role writ large in terms of this whole uh, approach? Uh, have, you, have you educated your colleagues about this? Well, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that's one of the keys. And, and I'm chuckling about the school board members not having many teachers. The Senate doesn't have a lot of teachers um, either, nor does the House of Representatives. But uh, one thing about education policy is everyone's an expert because they all went to school. Everybody went to school. So <laughs> that makes everybody an expert. And uh, so it is difficult um, to sort of muddle through the noises that are out there around education because Legislators all hear from constituents they like or don't like this or that policy that's going on. And they're very frequently making up their minds based on the level of voices that they hear, which is not very conducive to good public policy, particularly something as important as education. So um, we've really, in the recent years, really tried to bend over backwards and get much more input from the field. Um, I think that's a mistake that is what made way too often that legislatures will pass um, legislation without, I mean, you get teachers come in and, and testify, but that's not the same as taking a policy, vetting it with them, getting a lot of feedback, adjusting that policy before you ever even introduce it and put it out there. And, um, you know, this whole area of social emotional learning um, is new. It's not something they've heard about before. So. 
it's particularly challenging to try to get some good information in front of legislators before we sort of jump into this field, which we haven't done a whole lot of up to now. Well, I guess, the Superintendent, you, you do have teachers working for you, and you, you are interfacing with the education community. It's, it's the daily job there. How, how does this uh, get embedded in terms of both the sort of the policy or, or the planning that you do as a, as a leader of this department, how does that fit sort of in that interplay of a, a few federal dollars with a, a voracious federal appetite to tell you what to do with all of your dollars too? Um, and and uh, where, where is the education committee writ large in terms of recognition or acceptance or disposition toward SEAD? Yeah, I, you know, I think Ohio has a pretty good track record. So if you, if you went into uh, our materials and looked at what is Ohio doing, you'd start, you'd see a set of school climate guidelines, which was one of the very first things that we did. And then we have a really strong anti-bullying, anti-harassment, anti-intimidation uh, set of policies and model, you know, and model policies for districts to adopt. We just recently enacted uh, the senators under the senator's leadership, House Bill 10, which speaks to truancy, chronic absenteeism. And again, putting some meaningful, um, uh, we're in fact working right now on the model policies mm -hmm. and guidelines around the implementation of that. Uh, we've got a safety, uh, you know, a set of safety policies and guidelines. Uh, we've got a set of positive behavioral interventions and supports and uh, restraint and seclusion guidelines. So, so we have this policy framework. The challenge, I think, is how do you, how do you then help engineer the, the, the practice that has to own and adopt those ideas and, and then customize them to, the, to what's happening in that particular community, that particular school, and so forth and so on. So that's where, again, we challenge ourselves at the department to say, we've got this fairly strong policy framework. How do we then provide the professional development, the, the, the taking examples like what's happening here in Cleveland and sharing those and helping each school district and in fact sometimes each teacher see themselves in someone else's practice and say, yeah, we, we need to be doing more of that in our school. Because we know from experience that anytime, you know, we come out with a law or a policy, that's all well and good, but it doesn't make a difference until somebody mm -hmm. grabs it, runs with it, and actually owns it in terms of what they're implementing and, and, and customizing it to meet their own particular circumstances. Well, I think I know the answer to this, but yesterday we were cautioned, you know, and said, look, one of the one of the things, even with a, a, a national commission that's trying to do a report from, from the nation uh, about what works or what might be pathways and strategies to better outcomes, is that you, you don't want something to be the SEAD in a box or the SEA, where I, mm -hmm. I take it yeah. off the shelf and okay. Or it's a little checklist. Yeah, we, I just we've got to check the box. Mm -hmm. that, the, that within the 102 Cleveland schools, there's very different strategies yes. there, east side, west side, uh, younger older killed children, um, and certainly Ohio, rural, urban, uh, suburban, and that there may be different aspects that need to be emphasized depending on where you are. And so that customization you talked about, how, how does one get that? How does one get the information out there with the, uh, you know, whether it's a one of One of the or, biggest challenges to that particular issue is time. Um, and it's very, time is not something legislators respect um, because they've got two year terms and they've got to get that done and they want to see the results. But with education policy, it's literally like taking the big ocean liner and trying to turn it around. You can't do it overnight. And you have to sort of, with major significant changes, you have to change the culture of the school. You have to provide the professional development parental support, all of these things for any major new policy. And that just can't occur within that limited time frame that we so often try to stuff it into. The, the challenge, it seems to me, in part then, is with the S and the E, the social and the emotional, to bring that online fast enough to have an impact on the A, the right. academic. Because mm -hmm. if we take, uh, we take every state, but we can you know, that, that more than half the children when they finish the third grade aren't reading proficiently, according to the nation's report card. Uh, Massachusetts, I think, is, 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 remains at the top, but what would it take to have, you know, 75 percent of Ohio children uh, reading proficiently or maybe older, a little older, you know, doing math at a, 
at a great level. And that's that's where we're, you know, I think you're you're trying to you're trying to address the challenges in order to get the on the social and emotional Results. side. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's the integration right. of right. all this. Yeah, I mean, you know, so so to your point about um, how, how do you you know either take things to scale or spread the spread the good news? I think one of the one of the beautiful things about having 600 plus school districts and a good number of charter schools as well is that you'll you will have examples in different settings right so other big urban districts can look to cleveland and say oh yeah we look a lot like them let's understand what they're mm -hmm. doing and and again when it resonates when people say oh yeah that that could work for us that's great but uh, a small rural district isn't going to say I, they don't see themselves in Cle so we have to supply enough models and enough different examples so that people can be inspired and then and then go through that customization and ownership process where they say, yeah, we, you know, we know our kids have this particular challenge um, and we see that these strategies are what's working. The role we can play too is helping people uh, get access to evidence-based practices, the latest research, and, and even broker networks and relationships between a district that wants to do something more and a district that maybe already is doing something more so that they, we can stimulate that sharing of ideas and the creative energy that comes from uh, you know, wanting, to, wanting to make a difference and maybe not always knowing quite how to start or how to, how to take that first step. I, I think that's a question. That, I think that's a very helpful response, and I'd, I'd be curious, maybe Senator Ferd, you know, how do we take, what recommendations can we develop that, and how to provide information that might be useful? Would there have been something to a Senate <laughs> education chair or to a, you know, a leader on a large urban uh, board of governance, say, if, if this, boy, this would have been, I wish I'd have seen this back mm -hmm. then when I was getting started. Right. And I, I think uh, being flexible uh, is important because, as you said, no two school districts are going to be the same. So, and it gets us out of that checklist mentality if it's too prescriptive. So, to have guidelines that address the issues and letting the local districts kind of figure it out, I think is important. Uh, much like the federal government is doing with the ESSA, uh, pushing it back to the state and saying, here are the guidelines and you guys kind of figure it out. Uh, I think that's important to us locally uh, because, and I, and I don't know if we do enough of this, but the social and emotional piece has to apply to our staff too. Staff members bring issues to work and things that may interfere with education, and how do we deal with those? That's a very interesting point. That was, that was emphasized repeatedly yesterday that, mm -hmm. hey, this isn't just the classroom teacher. It's the custodian. Mm -hmm. It's the bus driver, maybe the security guard. And anybody in that child's sort of education environment coming to and going from, and, right. um, mm -hmm. that's a very good point. One of the so, key things I think that uh, we really need to pay some attention to is one of my fav fav uh, favorite quotes is um, from Frederick Douglass, who says, it's easier to build a strong child than it is to repair a broken man. And from that, I've really carried away, you know, let's start at the very beginning. Let's start with that three-year-old. I mean, ideally start before that, but when we're looking at the school system, really, we're one of the few nations in the world certainly high-performing nations that doesn't offer universal preschool to three and four-year-olds. And, you know, if ever there is an opportunity to intervene with the socio-emotional development of that child, it's at that age, and yet we don't do it. Um, and we're getting better about that in Ohio. Mm -hmm. We're slowly, way too slowly, in my opinion, adding um, uh, high quality. And the Cleveland community is thoughts. doing some really good things right. in that Right, they're doing too. wonderful stuff. Yeah, I, I think what we want to do is open this up, uh, get the commission and some of our guests involved here, and then uh, I'll come back. We'll, we'll let uh, you all get a chance to make a closing observation, but I'll tell you what I'll probably ask you is, okay, you've heard all of this. What are those final recommendations to us in terms of how we should proceed and go forward? But for now, um, let's open it up. Mr. Bridgeland. Thank you. And thank you so much for this wonderful morning panel and all you're doing in Ohio and in Cleveland. You mentioned ESS, ESSA pushing um, uh, more power and authority back to the states. 
But there is this opportunity under Title I with 7% of the resources to be used for these uh, district and state implementation plans to help the low graduation rate high schools. And I wondered in particular, Dr. DeMario, how, how you're thinking about the role of SEL in uh, taking advantage of this historic opportunity as districts and states are looking at the, the schools that are graduating 67% or less uh, of their students how you're thinking about the policy implications of SEL for that opportunity? Yeah, so I, uh, that's a great question. And ultimately, the way we approach those kind of issues in Ohio is, we, is what we've developed is a model for improvement that we call the Ohio Improvement Process. Um, and, and the nice thing about it is it's actually strategy neutral. But what it does is guide districts through a process of not only how they organize themselves, a district leadership team, building-based teams, teacher-based teams, um, but then using data analysis, right? So what we really want people to do is, is understand that your particular high school has its set of challenges for some particular reason. So let's try to understand that. And we know that in the process of doing that, they, they may identify social-emotional issues that are a challenge. It could be absenteeism. It could be, um, you know, safety issues. People don't feel safe, uh, um, you know, a whole host of other things. And so then we have a set of state support teams that are regionally deployed, and we also have uh, our educational service centers, which are regional service agencies across the state. And, and in combination, we try to provide supports to those individual organizations, districts, and, and buildings. Uh, in identifying the challenges and then finding the, 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 the research and the evidence base that helps them address those specifically. So what, what we have been trying to do you know, in the last year or so is be more deliberate about including those social emotional factors in that because previously the focus was much more on what does the academic data show us. But, but we've recognized that that's, that's not enough. Uh, and so we're, we're migrating to say, okay, what does the social emotional data show us? And, and in the meantime, we're also trying to address the fact that are we doing really due diligence about being, um, being uh, uh, good about collecting data on the social emotional side, which as you know is a little bit, a little, a little bit more tricky. To, to, to uh, let me follow up on that, John's question, it's an excellent question and uh, discussion. Uh, did you sort of try to do a survey or, I mean, to, to those fields or those, those data points that you measure, and, and you mentioned absenteeism, and we were impressed yesterday to learn that now, now we're talking in terms of hours, not, not just days, but is, is, you know, am I late every day by uh, mm -hmm. two hours for some reason? Or, so what other factors, I mean, do you, do you feel you've, you've, you've got all of that? Because I think a lot of schools, maybe don't collect this? I mean, do you, do you look at teacher absenteeism? Are there, what other, uh, other uh, I don't know, interaction with juvenile justice system? I think some of your changes sounds like Senate Bill 10 goes at some of that. Uh, but but how, do, how do you get that list uh, of those factors that you look at that you want to look at and you think every school board and every teaching community will look at? Well, so I, I want to tip my hat to Cleveland because Cleveland has one of the, a really good climate survey that they use to collect very nuanced data that we have not yet gotten to the point. And we're very careful at the state because, you know, the burden we impose every time we want an additional data point. Mm -hmm. but, we, but we are collecting data about disciplinary in incidences mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and, and bullying. Uh, we're, and we're also in that sort of exploratory phase about should we be piloting um, s some type of climate survey or other tools or making them available to districts in the interest of a allowing the better collection of, of applicable and relevant, relevant data. So I'll, I'll be the first to confess that we're, I think we're still at, a, at an early stage yeah. of looking at the data side of it. We've got a couple of things that we think are useful. I don't know if you want to comment well, on One that. of the things that we're looking at right now is uh, suspension and expulsion mm -hmm. rates in addition to truancy. Um, we have, um, I'd be kind of curious if anyone in the audience would like to guess how many suspensions we have under the age of eight in Ohio. Anyone want to guess? 100. Too many. 100? <laughs> I'm sure it's really low. <laughs> well, there's 36,000 suspensions handed out wow. to 17,000 separate children. Under the age of eight. Under the age of eight. And that's, you know, only the beginning. And every time you take a child who's misbehaving and put them out of the classroom for two, three days, they're not only losing academic performance, but you're doing great harm to their attitude towards school. This is not a place I belong. They throw me out. They don't like me. They're not feeling safe. 
so just the tremendous damage we do from <coughs> policies like that. But we haven't really, I mean, we collect that data, but we haven't dug down deeply to see, you know, what we can do perhaps to eliminate that policy, you know, eliminate the ability to do that at all. That's going to be a really heavy lift, but I'm looking at it going, I don't know how we talk about social emotional development without looking at that policy really hard. Yeah, I, I think the change in that policy is critically important because it lays the foundation really of a pipeline to prison instead of a corridor to college exactly. in a lot of ways. Uh, I had a question and it has to do, it really I think it could be relevant for a State Department of Education, a legislature or a district, uh, which is um, uh, nationwide there's great interest in promoting the social and emotional development of all students. Clearly the ones who are at risk are part of the, the equation, but how do you educate knowledgeable, responsible, caring, contributing kids who are going to be good citizens, effective in the workplace? There's more and more work, in addition to academic performance, there's more and more research to say that addressing those social and emotional skills systematically lays a foundation for a more successful life. And my question has to do with increasingly um, uh, states and districts are developing um, uh, both imp implementation guidelines but also uh, specifying what kids should know and be able to do to provide some guidance. So there, all 50 states have preschool social and emotional development standards. There are seven states who have pre-K to third standards. And then there's four states, Illinois, West Virginia, um, uh, Kansas, Pennsylvania. So it's a broad diversity who actually have developed pre-K to 12 uh, standards or competencies. And I'm just kind of wondering, uh, and also some districts, Cleveland has them, for example, other districts around. Um, the country are developing these things so people have a clearer sense of what we want, the competencies we want kids to develop. So I'm just kind of wondering what your take is on doing something like that at, uh, at the state level. Also, legislatures have supported this work uh, by um, calling, uh, Illinois was an example where there was legislation um, to support the development of standards by the State Department of Education. So. Just we we have here in Ohio PK to three uh, social emotional learning standards and, and have been discussing and I, I think we've basically decided that we're going to do uh, through grade 12. So, so uh, and, and, and again, we're really attracted to that idea because it helps provide a framework, a common language, you know, a common point of reference for those kind of discussions. Again, my same comments about, you know, uh, po policy stops and practice has to pick up are, are the, you know, the realities. How do we then take those standards and put the professional development and the, and the support structures around and, 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 and even infuse it into teacher preparation and leadership preparation programs to make sure that that gets carried out. Let's see, Tim. Um, so uh, <clears throat> we live in uh, arguably one of the most divisive periods in American history, um, whether it's partisanship or paralysis or whatever. This is a state that has um, been in the middle of major political debates, uh, obviously recently, but for some time. Uh, my question um, is, how do we make this a purple issue? And secondly, how do we avoid some of the ways in which public policy often is destructive of child development by mm -hmm which it often does, you've all alluded to this, staying in your lane, avoiding the two-year cycle, not imposing excessive standards. You know, I think most of us would say we don't want another categorical mandate, uh, but at the, so we want a shift in the paradigm, not another policy-driven fad. So it's a two-part question. How do we avoid the fadism that policy often creates, and how do we keep it purple so that we focus on kids and not on politics? I think, I think you keep it purple <coughs> by not concentrating on how you keep it purple. <laughs> one, one, one of the benefits of <laughs> one of the benefits of being an appointed board 
we're nonpartisan. You don't know if I'm Republican or Democrat. You may be able to figure it out over time, but I have no allegiance to either party. How I vote is no one's business, but how I govern this district has got to be in favor of the 40,000 kids who walk in our front door every day. And I can't, the best advice I got in Washington after the election, someone said, do not focus on personalities, focus on the goal. So I think as long as you do that, because eventually you're gonna have another president and another administration, and you can't be worried about who's in the White House when you're dealing with the future of these kids. I think one of the reasons I really like education policy and have sort of put myself in that category um, is it is one of the most nonpartisan issues, mm -hmm. frankly, out, out there. Um, you do get agreement <coughs> on most issues um, is across partisan lines. Now, that came dangerously close to changing, I think, in the last <clears throat> few years with the opposition to Common Core um, that became a very politically charged issue. Um, hopefully we've put that one to rest and we can go back um, to concentrating on what's best for kids and what and not necessarily what is best for a political party. Um, I think the danger if we're looking at the landscape today I think there is danger of the school choice issue raising partisan politics again mm -hmm. with the appointment of Betsy DeVos, who obviously is championing <coughs> school choice. Um, I think some people will take positions against school choice just because it's a Trump policy. Um, and um, we won't really debate the real benefits or the problems, uh, the real challenges of school choice. Um, but overall, I think it's, it's, a, uh, it's a very bipartisan subject, unlike anything else we have. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll speak a little bit to the fatism issue, because I think, I, I get the sense that teachers have understood this for a long time. And, and, that, and that government is sort of late to the table in recognizing it, which is the danger, right? Because we'll immediately bureaucratize it and, and you know, suck all the, all, the, all the reality out of it. Um, so, so I think that's the, that's the thing we have to avoid is that, and, and, and I think we get at that by holding up the teachers as, as the exemplars in, in the context of school buildings and, and, then, and then districts, and it's that, it's that tiering, right? So, so because a teacher who, who recognizes that I have this need in my classroom, or a principal who recognizes that I have this need in my building, but may not just know how to do it, will be much more amenable to hearing from another teacher or hearing from another principal, rather than flipping to a state web page and a policy booklet or something that has tried to you know, put in a bottle uh, the magic of, of social emotional learning. So, so, so I think if we can gingerly walk that fine line and, and leverage the great stuff that's happening, that's the, that's the other beautiful thing about it. It's not like there's a dearth of stuff. It's like, let's, let's elevate it, let's showcase it and highlight it. And I think that's how we get to that, uh, avoiding the fatism piece of it. Because it's so powerful at the end of the day and the results draw, will drive the difference. Uh, John, you wanna? Yeah, sorry, but I, I, no, no, that's, I, I, I can't help. Is, just, if anybody wants to ask questions, <coughs> just give me a little high side and all. So I, I'm so taken by the, the vision of like listening to the teachers and the students and engaging them in the process and not over bureaucratizing uh, rules. But I actually heard from a teacher yesterday at the table discussion that there are some interventions that are so powerful and potentially so strongly evidence-based that it's actually very helpful when the district or even the state requires them. And one example that gets to the 37,000 under eight-year-olds who are being suspended and told they're not, you know, don't belong in the building are the planning centers. And she said it's, it's so great that Eric Gordon requires in 102 schools that we have planning centers as an alternative to suspension. So I just wondered from each of your perspectives, are there, uh, as the National Commission grapples with what policies to hold up that are effective across uh, districts and, and states, uh, any policy breakthroughs like planning centers or others that maybe should be at least nudged along or maybe even required at the district level? I mean, you, you, you make a great point, and, and I'll, I'll recount a little bit of a story. I was in Canton City 
Uh, they have the uh, Yutz Academy that just spent the last two years implementing a restorative justice program that ran into exactly the kind of thing. And, and, and I had the opportunity to talk to three beautiful children who, 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 who were so able to convey the change that had taken place in that building by virtue of this, how, how, how the number of fights were lower and the, and the sense of positive energy in the room was greater. And then the teacher spoke of the struggle that it took for them to, to engineer this transition. And she pointed to the, to the principal and the, and the assistant principal and said, I really appreciate that they did not let go. They, did, you know, they were persistent. In that, uh, in that kind of thing. So, so I, I mean, uh, I, 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 what you say really speaks to me because I think there are those times where, where strong leadership, and, and again, I don't necessarily point to the state as being that source, but especially at the district and building level, um, uh, but supported by teachers that see enough of the value because it's such an important part of the implementation mm -hmm. that, it, that it happens. I, I'm not sure I can, articulate one particular strategy that I would say right now, you know, ought, we ought to go ahead and say everybody ought to do this. But, but again, it'll be interesting to see what comes out from you all on that front. I do think it would be helpful if we created more space for teachers to do collaboration, planning, time for that sort of thing. Um, you know, once again, looking to our international peers, we know that they spend far less time in classroom in front of students actually teaching than our teachers do, who say, you know, we don't have any time to figure out how to do things better. Um, one of the thing about the suspension and expulsion thing is, um, if we're going to get rid of suspension and expulsion, we need to replace it with something else. And that something else is where the individual districts and the teachers, schools need to weigh in and figure out what that something else is. But are we going to give them the space and the time to do that? I think you do see a little bit of you know, positive behavioral intervention and supports sort of coming of age in, in that sense that this is a strategy that's customizable enough where in some ways um, it is that, it's that, that secret to creating a culture mm -hmm. that's focused on those kind of behavioral and, and, uh, um, and social emotional conditions that you could almost say that that's, that's something you could, um, uh, that you could uh, put on the list. Do, do we do a, a good enough job of, of capturing what is working, where it's working, and telling other people about it? It, it, it strikes mm -hmm. me that, this, that, that in the world of education, uh, say unlike business, where somebody's built the better widget, everyone's, well, mm -hmm. I gotta build my widget at least that well, and I'm gonna see if I can't improve it. Education might launch a study to see if we couldn't build, figure out a brand new way to build the widget rather than just taking what clearly may be better than what they're doing. And mm -hmm. how does this, you know, what, is that cultural? What's, what's going on? <laughs> how is that a, maybe a social and emotional development of education yeah, yeah. leadership to <laughs> try to take what's working better and just use that before we invent? I think, I think we do a good job of, and I can only talk locally, we do a good job of telling our story, um, both nationally and on the state level. I'm not sure if once the story is told, if many people take the lessons learned and run with them. Yeah. Um, I belong to a couple of national school board associations, and I hear good stuff going on all over the country, but I'm probably in that same boat. I don't grab those things and bring them back home and say, you know, look what they're doing in Denver, or look what they're doing in Boston, and we should look at this, or we should give this a try. And I'm not sure if that's happening. People just kind of say, boy, that's a great idea. Yeah, I think there's a tendency, that's a great idea, but right. it won't work in my school for yeah. this reason or that reason. Yeah. But you're, you're right. I don't think we do a good yeah. enough job of sharing um, the good news uh, when we see it. And uh, we need to do a better yeah. job of it. I think that's that. Yeah. There, because there are programs that work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are schools that are doing an absolutely wonderful job with nurturing, um, taking care of their um, kids. We have a school here in the state of Ohio that I said, if one more person mentions Euler's school to me, I'm gonna scream. <laughs> Euler is a school in Cincinnati that has every kind of wraparound service you can imagine. They've made significant economic, um, academic gains. Um, it's just, it's the model. 
But every time we have this discussion, it's like, you should go visit a oiler. Well, is anyone replicating oiler? It's been <laughs> out there now for five years, and I've yet to see, hey, this school's just like oiler was. <laughs> but instead, but we do see it. lots of other, I mean, th so this is what I see, is lots of places are, are trying similar things, similar strategies. So there are, I, I, I'm, I, I totally agree that we don't do, and I say it all the time, we don't do a really good enough job. And, and now with social media and, and so forth, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to explore how we can be more both deliberate and, and distributive mm -hmm. in terms of the great practices that are happening out there in the interest of showcasing and, and letting people see. Uh, and, and, and then adapt and be inspired by those kind of stories. So it's definitely a place where we can be doing more. James. Uh, thanks for everything you've said so far. Um, I hear us in the conversation um, having two parts. Uh, one is how do we keep finding these things that are better than the status quo today? And how do we take the things that actually work to scale? Um, but I also hear uh, something that tends to happen in a lot of our conversations where we are focus a lot on what I call the, the bottom end of Maslow's hierarchy on the social emotional continuum of how do we deal with the trauma? How do we deal with the behavioral issues? How do we fix discipline? And yet I know you guys know well that as you start to think about the other elements of social, emotional, and uh, academic development, that we want much more for our kids. So I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about um, once we get some of these basic building blocks in place, where do you see going and how do we actually build the capacity over time for folks to both imagine something different and then to do something different than what we see today? So, I mean, I think in some respects, we, you know, we continue to, there, I think there are places out there that are looking at those, those kinds of things as well. That, that, that the, 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 the areas that you talked about maybe are the most evident, but I think people, people um, are doing things that speak to the broader range. Um, you know, project-based learning, it just uh, engineering um, uh, communities of learning among students that create both a more powerful academic experience and a more powerful social experience. Um, uh, it's, I, don't, I don't think it's that rare. Sometimes we don't talk about it, you know, feature it a, as much. But I think those kinds of things, it, it, again, the same sort of strategies, how do, we, how do we highlight them, how do we elevate them, how do we um, help people feel the power of the successes that they have? Uh, that, that it's, I'm not sure I see it so much as a, you know, I get the first things first, safety and a, and a warm building and those kinds of things, I get that. But I think, I think there's a lot happening on, some, on many of the other levels. You know, one of the things that we hear a lot is there's no money for it. Um, I, I sort of have to challenge schools sometimes to say, you know, you've got to figure out how to do this without money because there isn't going to be money for you to change this. Now, you know, as a policymaker, we can say this will be a priority. We will make sure that there's money. But we use that lack of money, I think, sometimes as, as an excuse to not change how we are doing things. Hey, I think that uh, oh, go ahead, Graham. a lot of these things can be, can be accomplished and have been accomplished without money because it's about bringing the right experts into your district to address some of these problems. So you bring the county, the city, the state, uh, the police department, those people who already do this work every day and you find ways to infuse them into your, into your school district, those things don't cost any money. There are some things that, that do cost, but there are a lot of things that we can do collaboratively, people working across their individual silos to get this work done. Professional yeah. development costs money. Mm -hmm. yes. It absolutely costs money, but we hear all the time that a great percentage of professional development is a waste of people's time. They're taking courses that don't benefit them in the classroom, and maybe there needs to be a little bit more direction given to, you need to spend X number of hours on professional development on C issues. I, I do think example. the Cleveland contract actually is helpful in this area for, for the kind of knowledge and preparation that's what in Cleveland SEL, mm -hmm. uh, so that that does strike me. That, mm -hmm. but I but I would agree. I think there's a maybe a flaw in the old model of Masters Plus on you know, mm -hmm. and that can be, you know, mm -hmm. something I'm doing in the summer to check those boxes to right. climb those courses versus 
I, I saw where the state of Mississippi, of all places, actually mandated about three, four years ago, every teacher they were going to hire in the elementary school have a reading specialization. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so that, that kind of a direction uh, incented would mm -hmm. be more Helpful. productive, perhaps, than some arcane yeah. master's thesis on something. I mean, if, something we, really, like if we really look at <laughs> teacher performance as opposed to, you know, grading the teacher on the test results, saying here's where students seem to be lacking, we need to spend more time on that subject matter and get more professional development in this school on how to teach math. If math scores are down, let's... Now, now we did hear from the, uh, in the next panel we'll have community representatives, including the teachers union will be part of that, but uh, we did hear from some teachers as they said, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of tests mandated in Ohio, and there's a governor's commission, I guess, looking at testing at this Oh, it's the time. superintendent. I think it meets today, yeah, right? right. <laughs> Maybe even because I think one person said, I'm going to Columbus nice. to meet today or something. Uh, so uh, they said, boy, if that could, that, that could help a little bit. They were mm -hmm. tested on the way in, we're tested on the way out. Uh, a lot of testing. So I'll, I'll leave that. We've got two questions queued up here, three questions here. Let me. I go to Dr. Col I will go. I go with age before beauty here. <laughs> so we'll, go to Dr. we'll go to Dr. Colmer first. Here. <laughs> yeah. Get, take so, age. Gene, yeah. No worry. If you if, if you age is the criteria, then I win. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the issue of transferring and disseminating good things. Uh, I heard, and I hear. Um, I heard you mention engineering, and I, I'm wondering if an engineering mentality, more than or as much as professional development, isn't needed to get the transfer, hmm. because we have teachers on the front line very often with no mechanism and no mentality that they can use things from other places and how do you do that in my particular place where I'm working? How do I do it? I sometimes think there's no mentality, that they don't think that way. And if we can help people think about how we take things from one place to another and make them fit. But that's a mindset change as opposed to simply having information about what goes on in another place. I, I don't know. I, I think actually the mentality is there. It's the opportunity that might be missing, right? Uh, you know, and, and so I, I, I think increasingly when I, when I hear a great success story, there's usually a visit, a school visit. As somebody went somewhere. Somebody heard about somebody else doing something. And they went there. And they saw it. And they got sort of immersed in it. And, and, it, and it lit a spark, right? And, and, I, and, and I've come to increasingly believe that, that getting out and, and being exposed to things, because if you don't, if all you know is what, what you know, um, you have to somehow do it. Now, you know, I think places like the Teacher Channel and other, with the use of video and social media, you're, sometimes you can make those trips virtually, but there's really nothing quite like actually yeah. seeing it in practice. Um, and so, so I think, I, I actually think the dispositions are there uh, it's just how do we create those opportunities and the time element, I think, is another piece of that. Um, this is a uh, historic time in terms of the shift in relationships between the states and the federal government. I know, are you on the September uh, clock, probably? Uh, and I know the two of you are having conversations about this opportunity. I know there are lots of fears uh, about what states would do, but uh, I think there's some optimism there that we have some opportunities. I'm wondering, as you're thinking about those deadlines, um, do you see greater opportunity uh, to make some of these changes that are inhibiting the work, and do you see a place in all of this for promotion of social, emotional, academic development? It, it, would you set the context of Every Child Succeeds Act, what your reference is to September? Yeah, so, so we are, in fact, uh, Gene, as you, as you um, implied, you know, we are moving forward towards submitting our application in the September uh, time frame. Uh, you know, I think, I think what we're doing in Ohio is actually looking beyond that, right? As I rattled off, we've got a number of things already that we're doing in terms of school conditions, social-emotional learning. And so, so rather than sort of 
do it only because of our, of our ESSA application. We're, we're also engaged in a statewide strategic planning process that cuts across all aspects. And part, part of the reason we, we launched that was because people were saying, well, we ought to do this thing in our ESSA plan. And it was like, well, there's really no place to talk, talk about that. So, but the, let's not make that the reason to not do it, right? If it's something that we need to do as Ohioans for Ohio kids, let's do it. Um, and so, so yes, definitely social emotional learning um, as, as we're structuring our strategic planning process, there's going to be a whole sort of pillar uh, of the framework around student supports, school conditions, and school climate that I think is going to speak directly uh, to, to these issues and, uh, and have exactly this kind of uh, conversation and provoke us to adopting additional strategies. So, uh, so yeah, we're, we're excited about that work. There's some thi things where there's an intersection with, with ESSA and federal funding, but at the end of the day, you know, it's a small slice of the action here, and we've got so much more we can do. All right, and then Karen's on deck. Um, good morning, and thank you for being here. It's clear that you all care about this very passionately. Um, as a commission, we've spent some time trying to understand what are the practices, the best practices for really integrating cell into the schools, and a lot of the focus is on the school side of it. But as we begin to think about the ecosystem for education at the local level, it's broader than just the school. And I think, Senator, you mentioned that kids spend more than half their time outside of the school. So we began to think about who are the stakeholders in that ecosystem locally that really matter. And I'm curious if you think that other groups like faith-based groups or um, you know, business groups or other groups locally can be part of the linkage that we need to think about in terms of embedding SEL concepts or, or just making the product, the children, a, a better product by being able to sort of have that leverage. And if you think it's important, I suspect you do, what are you each doing to make that a reality? Well, I think the um, more places you can get the same message, um, the better. So if you're getting one message at school, if that can be reinforced in after-school programs, in faith-based programs, in churches on Sunday, certainly in the family um, at home, um, the better, the more successful that's going to be. So I think that as we look at these plans for how we change the culture in our schools, we must look beyond the school day and see where can we get reinforcement for these ideas. Um, because you're right, I mean, if the kid spends six hours in school and gets one message and then spends the other 18 hours of their day getting other messages, which one's <coughs> going to stick? So. You're absolutely right, and, and, and I think if we don't do it, who is going to have that conversation? So. Mr. Hurd made a great point about partnerships earlier on, and I think we are seeing so, you know, the, the amount of partnership activity happening in the education space is growing significantly. Um, and, and, uh, and there are some things that the state can do. So for instance, we've, uh, we've funded, and I tip my hat to Governor Kasich because it came from, from his policy work, uh, the Community Connectors Program, uh, uh, sponsoring um, mentorships with the faith-based faith community and other potential applicants to really uh, bring the community members into schools to provide sort of mentorship. I'm seeing it blossom in, in all sorts of career areas. As you know, in Cleveland, many, many of the, the high schools have a career focus to them. And so the business community is deeply involved, not only in the facilities themselves, but through internships and, and work-based experience and summer, or summer programs. Um, I, I remember we were um, at, uh, at a school where a small group of, of manufacturers had put together a program where over the summer a student has to take apart a bicycle. They would collect bicycles, they would tear them down and re rebuild them as part of an engineering you know, focus and the kids would get to keep those bicycles. I mean, we're, we're seeing all sorts of, because what we find when we survey folks is businesses want to be helping out on the education side. Sometimes they don't know quite how. Educators want more business participation. They are not always sure quite how. And so we're looking for ways to increase you know, brokering and, and, and again, sharing great programs so that people can be inspired and say, hey, th we think this could work here. So um, I, I think there's a whole uh, level of untapped community kind of partnership and engagement uh, that, that, again, we have wonderful examples to draw from, and we need to do a better job of sharing and promoting. And if, the, if it takes a little bit of state money to kind of <laughs> seed and catalyze some of that stuff, then, then that's okay, too. The governor has a real um, strong belief in the marriage of the business community and our schools. Mm -hmm. And in, in his budget, he um, put forth an idea that 
kind of went over like a lead balloon, but um, <laughs> it was the idea that every teacher should do an externship with a business and that they should spend a couple days following around behind a businessman. And, and a lot of people sort of mocked it and it's sort of is disappearing from the budget as it works its way through the legislature. But really his point was a very valid one, which was, you know, we're preparing kids for the future. And if we as teachers don't really understand what that future is, what the job market are, what the opportunities are, we're gonna have a hard time conveying that to the kids. So we, we've got to figure out a way to make that happen. Um, it's probably not the way the governor put in the budget, but it, it needs to happen in some form or other. You know, and I, I want to, you raised a point that made me think about another point that I wanted to make today was about career technical education. I, I, think, I think there are social emotional aspects of career technical education that, that don't always surface in these kind of conversations that I think are really appealing. Uh, because of a number of, of things that happen in those kinds of settings that may not normally happen in other, other settings. So, so I plant that little seed out there because my own thinking is, is trying to develop around that, uh, around are, that idea. Are you, are you suggesting that there could be a way to uh, reduce the stigma on somebody who might be uh, choosing to actually have a high income in a, mm -hmm. with a skill? versus somebody right. goes off and yeah. gets a high load of debt from a general <laughs> college right. study right. degree. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Uh, yeah, we need to change the cultural thinking of that, regardless of what other, uh, else is happening, because it's just, it's just, you know, because the bottom line is those, those kids actually do better in college, too. This right. is, the, this is yeah. the thing. And with income, they can even pay their own way if they choose uh, to go back it. later. Yeah. 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 So it's a novel idea. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Karen, you've been awfully patient. You're, you're on deck here. Um, I'm going to pick up directly on that point, and, and thank you all for a wonderful panel. Um, and this is a question to you all that you can, you can potentially help the commission. I mean, over the course of the time that you all have been talking, um, as, as Jim Shelton pointed out, you, we've gone from um, the important conversation about what we can do to reduce barriers to belonging uh, for young people in schools, whether that's you're tracking data about absenteeism and bullying, et cetera, you're thinking about susp suspension, suspension, expulsion rates, and those really are policy changes that could happen at the state or the local level that you can track with data to see if we're really making these safe, supportive environments for young people, especially young people who are coming out of distressed or traumatic uh, uh, families and neighborhoods. Uh, and then, as Jim mentioned, and you went right into the conversation about then what can we do to increase opportunities for learning, for mastery. Uh, and I loved your phrase of more powerful academic and social experiences. And then you mentioned project-based learning and you've just talked about career tech is one of those places for academic and social experiences based on learning concrete things that we often don't put in that, in that category. So the question that I have for you is we've covered a huge amount of territory and almost everything that's been mentioned has a link to social and emotional and academic development and how they integrate. How do we communicate that? One of the opportunities that this commission has is to really set up a conversation for the nation. And are we, the, you know, the range of topics that you've covered um, on this panel, it's hard to hear those in the words social, emotional, and academic development or social, emotional learning. What recommendations do you, do you have as you're thinking about putting out guidelines in the state that go pre-K through 12? How are you going to tackle this so that people know what we're really talking about yeah. and how it fits into all parts of education, both work to reduce really barriers and, and inequities and work to increase uh, quality? That's a, that's a fantastic question because I think, I think we struggle with the language that we use, right, to talk about this sort of stuff. And, um, um, and uh, I don't, I don't think I have any answers. I'll, I'll be interested to see how your work progresses because, because we, you know, it's, it's like, you know, some people use like civil society, some people use like, you know, working together. I mean, because I think there are accessible ways to get to it. I'm, I'm just not sure uh, uh, what they are just quite yet. But you're really talking about how we communicate the need of this more than specifically how we provide it. Um, because um, well and describe what it is yeah yes. what it is yeah so that's a, that's, that's heard you got it figured out you got you're doing it but <laughs> I, I wish I'd be a rich man <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I'm, I'm kind of piggyback back off of what you just said, Karen. And uh, I, I'm a teacher, and um, I, I'm speaking for teachers. So right now, is it's an urgency. My kids are 58% um, of their first language is not English, and they come here for hope. They know education is the key to success, and they come to our country because they want to make a difference, and they know how to do it. But I feel like. We get stuck and we're all talking and it's so awesome and it's all so positive and I'm just so encouraged to have so many people mm -hmm. that have the same vision and passion. Yeah. But we're speaking to the choir here and I want this commission to really make a difference and it feels like, you know, especially when you go to the policy uh, part of it. And I was so sad to hear that we don't have more educators in there, you know, trying to figure out and help because they do know, they hear the stories of what's going on with their students and, mm -hmm. and what they need. And it just saddens me to hear that. And I want to know, how can we really make a difference? This is urgent. You know, I have kids with that work till 2 or 3 in the morning. And then they are at school because they know that's the way to succeed. And uh, what is your advice to us that we really can push this forward? Because our kids need it. They're, they live in fear right now. I have kids that come to school scared they're going to be deported or scared that there's going to be a war. And what can we do and what is your advice in your different stakeholder roles to us that we do? And, and I, I believe that positive media is really important. I, f I think we always dwell on the negativity of, w of what schools are doing, which is so sad because there's so many inspiring stories. And there's great stuff happening in our public schools. Yeah. Right. And oh, yeah. we need to make a difference. So what is your advice to us? Well, one of the things, um, this doesn't go to Karen's question as much, but it, it goes to a recommendation that we'd have you make, is our schools of education, contrary to what they will say if you ask them, are not <coughs> teaching social emotional learning to teachers. Because you ask the teachers who tell you, I was not prepared for what I faced in the classroom. Well, why not? They don't say I wasn't prepared to teach English, I wasn't prepared to teach math. Social emotional learning should be at the core, I think, of what you learn in schools of education, particularly when you're on an elementary school level. Um, and it's often embedded, even classroom discipline is embedded in the curriculum. You get a piece of it here, a piece of it there. But to just actually learn specific classroom management techniques are not taught, at least in all um, schools of education. Now, Wright State, where I happen to come from, Wright State University, um, teaches the PACS system. How many of you have ever heard of PACS? We did yesterday. It's, it's, a, it's a classroom. It's called the Good Behavior Game. Yeah, Some yeah, people yeah. know it as that. We talked about yesterday. Um, I have visited a school where teachers, every single teacher in that school, had a course on how to use PACS as teachers at Wright State. They'd learned it, and they were, this was a school nearby. Visiting that school was amazing. Just walking in the classroom, and this is a very low socioeconomic school, the atmosphere was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. But every teacher knew exactly how to deliver this particular program. And it's, it's just classroom management. It's not a course they're taking in. You know, kids aren't taking a course. Maybe Governor Kasich's proposal should be to have the university professors spend the day shadowing teachers. Well, yes. Yes. <laughs> that may be. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that would be at the very top of my list. Um, Good idea. Where are we at? Uh, I'm fine. Yeah, um, and really appreciating the, uh, the, the conversation here. One of the things I'm thinking about, just listening to how the conversation uh, has flowed, is, um, you know, the, defining what it is. Um, I've, I've heard that uh, come, come about. And the way I'm thinking about it is, what might be helpful, is for you to think about in Ohio, what is it that you want the educational system to produce in terms of students, and, and, and I mean, what would you want to be true at the end of a child's journey um, through the K-12 system? And why are those things most important to you um, in terms of what you want to be true? 
And then are there recommendations that you would give to us in terms of how we help make the case for how social, emotional, academic development um, were being deeply embedded in the ecosystem of how we educate young people? Um, can, you can make the case as to how that would help get us to that, 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 uh, that destination we want for, for, for students. That, that, that destination is probably defined differently by different people. As a school board member, I represent the families of the school district. And if I go to them and say, what does success look like to you and your children? And they'll tell me, graduation day. So everything must lead to and end with graduation. If their kid graduates on time, they feel that the system has served them well. What we have to do as a district is figure out what things along the way guarantee that goal. How we, and someone asked about how we communicate that to the outside world. Uh, some of the people we collaborate with, until you collaborate with them, don't necessarily understand how their role impacts kids. One thing the mayor of the city says is that there is no panacea. You know, if there is a single silver bullet to get this done, uh, it would have been done a long time ago. But it's all of these things working together. So when you start collaborating with people, organizations, groups, churches, whatever it is, they have to fully understand what role they play and how important it is to graduation day because that's the only day that's important to these families is that my kid walks around across a, a stage one day and gets a diploma. So how, how does what I do every day, whether I'm a policeman or uh, president of Cleveland State University, how, how does that help these kids get to that end point. So as you create these collaborations, I think it's important that you educate the people that you collaborate with so they understand what it is that they do that's important. Uh, because we're so, we're so used to, as a society, operating out of our individual silos. And you know, my silo is criminal justice, and so my job is to put people in jail. Well, maybe that's not always your job and maybe what you do every day can impact the kids, such as not putting so many of them in jail and getting rid of that pipeline or helping us get rid of that pipeline. What can we do as a school district to cut that pipeline off to jail? And you're the one that sees them on the opposite end every day and you're sending them to jail. Well, we wanna stop that process. What can we do to stop that process? What are you hearing in the courtrooms every day that we can impact here, or other people we collaborate with can impact there to short circuit that pipeline. So I think those are the things that are important to do, and it's not just one thing, it's, it's all things. The, the problem is you take that parent who's saying success is gonna be when my child walks across that, that, that uh, stage, and then that child starts his first job, if he gets one, mm -hmm and doesn't show up on time and doesn't know how to behave or perform at that first job and mm -hmm. loses his first job, that's where social emotional stuff comes in because it's those soft skills or those soft skills, their foundation is emotional health. And if they don't have that to begin with, they aren't going to develop the soft skills and all the learning in the world's not going to benefit them. So that's. So you you really you really Anthron's question is really it, it can serve as the last question because you ask you, you really did sum it up beautifully and put the question to the panel I think appropriately what what a, coming back to us what and I and where we are with this conversation Mr Hurd's comments Senator's comments it serves as can can we get to a point where we can say a that that walking across the stage not only represents the the completion of that phase but it also means you're now ready, ready. for the next phase and that could be college <coughs> ready which you, you'd like that to mean without remediation when you arrive and therefore if you arrive 
not needing remediation, your chances of completing soar. Yep. If you go into college and go into remediation, your chances of completing significantly diminish, according to all the data, or career ready to do just what the mm -hmm. senator described, to, to be able to work as part of a team or to show up or to, or to be prepared to learn them the specifics of a job. So, so it's a question of how do you take that definition and broaden it out in the yep. community so And then how do you measure it? That's, well, a, that's a real challenge. Yeah. But, but I, think, I think that definition also applies because college readiness, in order to see it in, I've known a lot of students who are academically smart, but they still fail in college because they, those other skills are also important in the college setting. Um, because you know it's about so self-regulation. You got to turn the term paper in. You know it can be brilliant. <laughs> right, time but you time don't management, uh, <laughs> you know. respecting of others, working in teams, collaboration, self-regulation. Uh, you know self-discipline, cultural competency. Those kinds of skills serve both. I mean, I mean that's why they're they're universal mm -hmm. in terms of whether you go down a career pathway or you go down a, a, a post-secondary education pathway. They're both going to serve you well, and it, and in some ways you need them in both to succeed. And it's why it's so important that we embed them in our schools, which I think we're only now really starting to So do. these are life skills, I mean, in one sense, social, emotional, academic life skills. I, I, but I think getting to that Karen question earlier, what's the it there? What, what do you, if, you're, if, if the general wants you to come into the military, what are you going to need to make it there? If Jorge wants you to come into business, what's that going to take? And, if, you know, Linda's going to admit you at Stanford, what's that going to take? Or Wright State or <laughs> Erie Community College, what's it going to take? Are you, yeah. are you ready to yeah. take the next step? Well, and, and, and I think beyond that, this, this is the thing I've been telling so many people. Things are changing so fast. And, and this ability to be adaptable, right? I mean, that's where these, these traits also facilitate uh, so much of what we see happening with the opioid crisis and some of these other phenomena are because of this hopelessness um, and, and I think it's, it's, the, it's not, not there, a piece of it, you know, has to do with your own set of knowledge and skills, but then your ability to uh, be adaptable in those times of change and uncertainty, these skill sets speak to that as well. Well, and, and we know that not completing to go back, and I think that's why there's such a premium in the community of saying, you gotta walk across right, that right. stage, mm -hmm. because you want really bad odds yeah. Don't don't, well, don't, don't right. get to the point you can walk across the stage, yep. and then they really fall into the basement. So this is a, you, you've been a terrific panel. This is sort of the last chance. Any any final thoughts, parting advice you want to give us? Uh, Antoine's question really gave everyone an opportunity to say something that was very very important. But but uh, to the commission, and you know you're writing the report. Your your line in that report, or you the the point you don't want anybody to miss is. What and uh, Superintendent, we'll, we'll start the way well, we began. We'll go right down the line yeah. here. Yeah, so I'll pick. I'll pick up on what was said. You know, you raised Maslow, and I, th I heard somebody say just recently, like uh, you have to you have to deal with Maslow before you can deal with Bloom, right? So this notion that the social emotional issues are so fundamental to creating the environment for excellence on the on the academic side. Um, uh, uh, it, but, but the fact that there's, li there's that linkage, it's not like one precedes the other, but it's a, it's a both and. And so, uh, so again, I, I just uh, commend you for the, for the great work you're doing and look forward to, um, to watching it unfold and having it inform the work we do here in Ohio. Yeah, I, I too think what you're doing is very, very important. Um, you are really kind of at the forefront of a cultural change in how schools run. I mean, if you, if you really are true to the mission of what you're trying to do here, it will be difficult work, but it will be so, so important. Because I think those, that 40% of the population that I talked about at the beginning of this, um, we will not see them being successful unless the work that you do is adopted. So good luck with it. Yeah. Forward to it. And I would just encourage you to keep thinking of it in kind of a multi-system attack <clears throat> because there is no one answer to this problem. Um, so we've gonna, we're going to have to find our friends in various corners of society, some of which we may not have even discovered yet, and uh, continue to, to work those channels to uh, get them engaged in public education, uh, whether they're social entities or governmental entities, uh, it's, it's going to be important for everybody to 
to pull on this rope at the same time. Well, I, I, I certainly want to thank all of you, and we'll leave you with the challenge because uh, education policy is local and state driven. And, and some states going to be the first state where 75% of the kids can actually read proficiently or done to third grade. Some mm -hmm. states going to be first in terms of getting every child with those life skills, those social, emotional, academic skills. And if Ohio does it, everyone will want to come here and figure out <laughs> what you did. And in the meantime, every business will want to come here and locate right. because they'll say the talent in the workforce justifies my investment in the state. So we need a state to be first to do this across the board. If a big city does it first, every other big city will want to be emulating it. They're already coming to look, but boy, uh, they'll start moving here and want to live here. If, uh, so uh, well, thank you very much uh, to the superintendent, the senator, Mr. Hurd. Great job today.